Well, good morning and, and welcome. We're studying through 1 Peter, if you'll go ahead and turn there. Well, we will look at 1 Peter 4. God has been meeting us in a beautiful way in this study. I, I think it's the right letter at the, for the right people at the right time, and, and the fruit is good. So thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our midst. This morning, we're going to take up a subject matter that I think is so crucial and important to the American church. Peter's now going to address the topic of suffering. It's one that I think we have gotten wrong in many areas of the church today. And if we've gotten it right theologically, I don't think we're as mature as we should be in it practically. And so Peter's been addressing it throughout this letter. It's it's been in every chapter. We've looked at it in one angle or another. We've seen it addressed uh, in each chapter, and now it's kind of drawn out. I'd call this a treatise of suffering. It's the conclusion of his letter, how do we suffer? And so Peter is uh, addressing a church that's under fire, a fire that's about to turn into an inferno under the cruel leader Nero, the emperor who who he burned down Rome because he wanted to rebuild it on a greater and more grand scale, and, and suspicion turned towards him. And when it started coming to him, he wisely pointed his finger at the Christians and said, they're the ones who burned down Rome because they were already a despised society. And what happened is a persecution broke out that would last for 200 years upon the early Christians. And if you named the name of Christ in this region... You were rejected and you were persecuted in society and you could be imprisoned and many of them will be martyred for their faith. And so there was a great cost if you took the name Jesus Christ upon yourself. And if you did, you had to have a a right theology of understanding suffering if you were going to follow after the King of Kings. The prosperity gospel had no hope in a region like this. You would have been laughed out and kicked out of town. But it does in our society. And the the whole principle of our existence is how do I avoid suffering? Our whole economy, our whole world is based upon how can I avoid suffering? And if I can't avoid it, how do I mitigate it with insurance and all of these other aspects? How can I remove it through doctors, prescriptions, drugs, health foods? How can I ease suffering? Our whole society is built upon a principle of how to avoid suffering, and it's just permeated right into the church, and we sit here with this phobia of suffering, and all I want to do is remove it from my life. Is that what the Word of God teaches us about suffering? Is that what this Word tells us? From cover to cover, this book tells us we are aliens and sojourners who align ourselves with Jesus Christ, and we swear allegiance to him at any cost, and we will be persecuted for it. Children of God, he said in chapter 1, will be put in furnaces by the God that you love and serve to purify and grow your faith. Followers of Christ will get mistreated, and they'll be persecuted, he said, by government and bosses and by unbelieving spouses as we've journeyed in Peter. This book is countercultural to everything that this world thinks. And we've seen it again and again as we have looked at this letter. The Christian thinks completely different than this passing away world. But when it comes to suffering, we must think about it in a whole new way than this world. We must have a whole new mindset as we think about suffering. Peter's going to give, uh, give us that this morning, I think as clear as you could possibly state it. Peter is the one who avoided suffering by denying the Lord Jesus Christ on the night in which he was betrayed. He was restored, and he's been purified, and now he's teaching us how to think about suffering with a renewed mind, the mind of Christ. By the Spirit of God, Peter will instruct us in how we're to think about suffering in our journey to glory. And the first I want you to hear is that it's inevitable. Suffering leads to glory. It's the Christian way. Suffering leads to glory. It will always be that way. We must get this. We have to understand it if we're going to think God's thoughts about our suffering. Because our making it to the end in faith demands that we understand this. 
We will be sitting ducks for the enemy if we have the world's thoughts towards suffering. He will destroy us. So when the suffering comes, and Peter's teaching us in many different shapes and sizes and colors, and when it comes, we will question God and his love. Or even worse, there were four soils that Jesus talked about, and, and, and they receive it. And one receives it, and he says, and when persecution will come against it, it's, the, it's like the one where the sun beats down on the seed and the plant, and it has no root, and it withered and died. And so when persecution and suffering comes upon our faith, we could be the ones that just dry up and die and say, this isn't what I signed up for. And so we need to understand a a treatise or a theology on suffering. As a pastor, I can't tell you I've watched this too many times. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose a false profession of Jesus Christ. You only signed up to avoid suffering. I came to Christ to avoid suffering, to avoid hell, and to avoid any hardships in life. I did not sign up to get more of it and to learn how to endure it. May God meet us here this morning and do more for us than we can hope or imagine. And I want to pray and ask God to open our hearts and our thinking on suffering and to give us his mind on how to think about it, how to endure it, and how to receive an an eternity of no suffering where there'll never ever be a threat of it forever and ever. The gates will always be open because we will have no threats for all of eternity. So suffering leads to glory. There is a journey of suffering, and we must get to that place of eternal peace. And so if you'll look with me, I'm going to read our passage and we will go to God together and ask him to do this for us. 1 Peter 4.12 Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God In this name, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will become the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved. What will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. May God add blessing to his word. Let's go to him. Father, I thank you for these words that you've inspired by the spirit of God. I thank you for the human instrument. I thank you for Peter and what he's teaching us in this book. And Lord, I I pray we are now treading on ground that few of us truly understand. And so we look to you that your spirit would illuminate this word. I pray that it would come forth as we learned in 1 Peter 4, that when we speak, we speak the words of God. I pray this morning that the words of God would be what we depend on and what is spoken from this pulpit. And I pray that you will use these words, Lord, to give us an understanding of suffering. I pray that you will make those fearful, courageous this morning. God, I pray for those who are timid in a world that's squeezing upon us, I pray that you will give them fresh courage. God, we we look to you. I I, I ask that the fruit would be for your name's sake, for the kingdom of God, to have courageous soldiers, understanding suffering, willing to endure suffering for your name's sake. God, set us free from the American way of no pain and no suffering. Lord, help us to think your thoughts about suffering this morning for your glory. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, our outline this morning is we're going to look at six ways to think about your suffering then with the mind of Christ. 
Before we start, I think it's important to set the context of what kind of suffering is Peter addressing. And in this context, it's very clear, it's persecution. This is suffering when the world comes upon you and it persecutes you. The sufferings that come from the outside because on the inside you have sanctified Jesus Christ as Lord in your hearts. And you've made it known to this world by word and by deed. And they're seeing it and now they're coming upon you. And this is saying, how do you get through that kind of suffering? And yet as we look at this this morning, the principles are exactly the same for any kind of suffering. If you have internal suffering with fears and doubts and anxieties, these principles will be effective. If it's external and it's persecution or maybe it's sickness, maybe you have financial struggles or family issues as you sit here this morning, it it can come from the world, it can come from within, it can come from God uh, with a fiery furnace. So whatever the situation, these principles will apply to your life and what your fears and what your sufferings are this morning, but the immediate context is that of persecution. It's a Calvary road to glory, and it's going to be strewn with suffering within and without. And all the truths that Peter's going to give us are principles that will apply to all suffering, though specifically persecution. So a word from, for everyone here uh, is, I, I believe there's no one free of suffering this morning. The fall has brought about death, and it's brought about suffering. It's brought more to the child of God now because all of society is against you as well. So now you got everything against you except God. And if God could be for you, who could be against you? So let's look at the wisdom then that Peter has for us in this passage. Our first point, uh, the, the, the mindset of Christ in suffering in verse 12, is don't be surprised by it. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. And I think what gives suffering the edge against us is is the harm that it brings to us because it, it surprises us. It's not the American dream. It's not what we've grown up with, and so it catches us off guard. I've spent my whole life avoiding suffering, so when it comes, why is this happening to me? We were designed to live in paradise. God made us to have shalom, shalom, peace, peace in his presence and fullness of joy with him. So we we were designed for perfect peace. We are hardwired to seek that and to desire that. So it, 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 so it does seem to come as a surprise for some reason now as it comes because of the fall and the whole process of what God is doing in our lives. So the number one thing that I have thought in my own heart under suffering and when talking with others, when it comes, what I hear most often is why? Why? What did I do? Why is this happening to me? And then the temptation is it to turn to God and say, you're not keeping your part of the deal. You said abundant life, and I'm just sitting here suffering, and those questions start coming forth. And Peter boldly says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. This is so critical to us enduring suffering well. There's a presupposition then that you must have that all who desire to live godly will be persecuted. You will suffer. You can't be knocked off course when it comes. When it comes heavily and mightily and wave after wave after wave, you, you can't be blown away and you can't be knocked over and say, why, this is not fair, am I on the right side? It feels like we're losing. Just begin with this presupposition, you will suffer. You will suffer. But, but Father, this is, this is what... This is what you promised for your children. This was the path that your son walked. This is the path that every faithful Christian has ever walked. This can't surprise me. Lose the American mindset. You will suffer. It's promised. You're going to follow Jesus Christ who suffered. He was the the man of sorrows. You will suffer on your path to glory. It, It just sounds so simple, doesn't it? But so many are surprised when it comes. We're surprised at persecution. We're surprised at prolonged singleness. We're surprised at the toughness of marriage. 
We're surprised by the pain of children rejecting and grandchildren and great-grandchildren the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're surprised by financial stresses that leave you humbled under the hand of God. We spend our days journeying to the celestial city, surprised at the fiery ordeals among us, saying, what did I do wrong? Instead of, how can I be faithful in the suffering, God, that you have promised to your children on this journey? Not surprised that our Father will do absolutely anything to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. He's predestined it. He's promised it. Guys, it takes suffering to be shaped and conformed to the image of Christ. Do not be surprised at what has been brought into your life and what you're facing in suffering. And in love, God will not leave us bubble-wrapped giving us everything our little heart desires. Some of you just need to hear that. You're not going to be bubble-wrapped on the way to glory. You will suffer. You will suffer. Don't be surprised at your suffering. Listen to what Jesus said in John 15. If the world hates you, you know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. And then in 2 Timothy 3.12, and indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, which I hope is every one of you, will be persecuted. If you want to live godly, you will be persecuted. If you're not being persecuted, the question is, am I living godly? If you live godly, this world will come against you. It will persecute you. Everything you love, this world hates, and everything you hate, this world loves, you're in for it. And Jesus said, know it. Know it. It hated me first, and it will hate you. Suffering is the price of discipleship. If your chief end is to avoid suffering... You will never boldly confront this world and you will never boldly even confront believers because it will bring discomfort and often pain and suffering. You will avoid it at any cost if that's your mindset, if that's your presupposition. I was going to read a whole bunch of scriptures this morning about suffering uh, so that you're not surprised because I want you to see that scripture has told us this from cover to cover one after another. And instead of reading them all, I'm just going to, in Matthew 5, 10 through 12, we studied that a long time ago in the Sermon on the Mount, but blessed are you when you're mistreated and persecuted and all kind of evil is said against you. You're, You're blessed, but you will be persecuted if you live out a beatitude life. 1 Peter 4, 4, we just studied it a few weeks back. He says that, don't be surprised, they malign you. They malign you because you live for this truth. In Matthew 10, it says there's a cost to follow Jesus, and they will even put you to death. Acts 7, 58, they stoned Stephen for his bright light. In Acts 5, 41, it says they were rejoicing because they were considered worthy of suffering shame for the name of Christ. In Acts 14, 22, it said through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of heaven. Throughout Acts, they're imprisoned again and again, it says, for the name For the name of Christ, naming that name put them in prison. Paul gave the whole list of sufferings that he endured for that name. I'm just going to read 2 Corinthians 6, 4 to you. Paul says, In everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, and the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold we live, as punished yet not put to death, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. In Hebrews, again and again, it's called to suffering. And so people expect it. Do not be surprised by it. I wonder how many spoiled kids believe this. I wonder how many spoiled Americans believe this. 
This is the promise by God to his children, and he wants us to expect it. And not, he says in verse um, 12, not as though some strange thing were happening to you. I want you to hear that this morning. It's not strange when you're being squeezed and persecuted and afflicted and all these things come upon you. Don't think it's strange. I counsel that more than anything else. This is strange. It's not strange. This is what is the norm of the Christian life. I I love weddings. I really enjoyed last night because you've got this innocent little couple and they're they're just in love and we're going to build this happy little life together. And what, what God is going to do to conform them into Christ is absolutely staggering. And they <laughs> sit there smiling, and us old guys are like, <laughs> yeah, and it's just hilarious. And I, I hate to share that at ceremonies, but I feel more comfortable from the pulpit to tell them. <laughs> it's like, get ready. Look at verse 12. I love how Peter begins it, Beloved. He's so pastoral. Beloved, you're loved by God when you suffer. And I just want you to begin there is with this suffering is the first question I hear is, is, does God not love me? Beloved, you are loved by God. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeals among you as if something strange were happening to you. You're loved by God, so he will afflict you. You're loved by God, so he will put you in a furnace. You're loved by God, so he will see that persecution comes upon you. It comes, he says, upon you for your testing. You remember back in 1 Peter, that metal put in the furnace to boil off the impurities of our faith. So if I'm ever going to grow, remember our faith is what perseveres us to the end, that God will protect us through our faith. So it, it has to be tried. It has to be persecuted. It has to be brought in the fire to improve it and grow it and deepen it and get the impurities of unbelief out of our lives. So beloved, you're suffering by the will of God for your good. Secondly, if you'll look with me in verse 13 then, don't be surprised by it, but in verse 13, Uh, rejoice in it. It's like he had to take it one step further. Okay, I'm not surprised, but rejoice in getting the tar beat out of me, Peter. Verse 13, to the degree that you share that word koinia, that you have koinia, that you have fellowship in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. So when you're suffering and having fellowship with Jesus, suffering as he did and all the rejection that he faced and it's coming upon you now, keep on rejoicing. So that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. To the degree that you suffer, keep on rejoicing. This is tricky. It seems so strange and it almost seems insensitive to my suffering. Just, is this like a stoic? <clears throat> Just kind of forget about what you're facing. Don't, what's that song? Don't worry, be happy. What's that going to do for you right now when you're about to go get crucified upside down? You see Peter whistling to the cross, don't worry, be happy. So many Christians live with that shallow, weak theology, and suffering will come and it will destroy that weakness of I'm just a stoic and you're just supposed to be happy. If our joy is based in our circumstances or our well-being, we're going to be slaves all of our days to how this life is going. You will be a slave if your life is based upon your circumstances for joy, one of the hardest things in the Christian life, we will be held captive to how we view this world in all of its brokenness and fallenness. We will just be controlled by what goes on and what we see. We'll be controlled by our news channels that bring anxiety and fear as this world is coming undone. I will just be under the influence and control of fear and circumstances for my joy. And how many of us sit here right now that the sovereign of my joy is my circumstances? And now Peter's going to address something that that will not be sufficient in suffering. Jesus has told us that the joy that he has, he's given to us. There is a joy that is not giddy, it's not circumstantial, and people, it's not worked up. This is what we're fighting for. It's a present tense Keep on rejoicing. Don't stop. Be rejoicing. Because to enter into this sweet place, this is joy in a person. 
This is joy in a reconciled relationship with God. This is joy that my past sins have been dealt with in Peter chapter 1. This is a joy that presently I've been put in the body of Christ. I have a cornerstone that all of my life is lived upon. And my future is I have this amazing hope where moth and rust can't destroy or take away. So I I have this joy that's unchanging. It's in a person. It's in God's plans and what he's doing. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I have to, by faith, anchor myself to that. I've got to anchor to it and not let my circumstances be what drives and controls my joy. And that is one of the hardest things in the Christian life to keep learning and growing in. And and right now, I want you to lift your eyes from all your suffering and to look unto Jesus Christ by faith and see what you have in Christ. And I don't want you to be giddy, and I don't want you to work up a big smile. I want you to let tears come down your face while you have joy in what God has done for you in Jesus Christ and will do. I don't want Stoics, nor does God. Look it in the face and weep. And then look and look at this Jesus Christ and keep on rejoicing. Romans 15, 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, what? In believing. In believing. This, this faith, this truth, in believing, he'll just keep filling you up. I love what Spurgeon said. It just keeps building off each other. Joy, peace, peace, joy. They just keep feeding as you keep believing the gospel that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this is the sweet place that joy is found in believing. All that the gospel declares to us. And so Peter says, to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. There's some kind of connection with suffering and rejoicing in Peter's mind and heart. And so how many of you have that connection this morning? How many of you have a a connection with suffering and rejoicing? What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. This is it. These two are joined together. Is Is this completely foreign to your thinking? Are you sitting here going, that guy's crazy. Those two can't be joined together. Scripture ties them together. Guys, I I want these two married in my life. I'm going to fight and pray over this passage till I get it. I want rejoicing and suffering married. And when they're not, you will spend all of your days trying to avoid suffering. Your chief end is how do I avoid suffering? Not how do I serve King Jesus? And if suffering comes with it, I will go with it. it, it, I just want to avoid it. No, I just want him. I just want to follow him. I want you to rejoice in in that which comes upon you and it drives you deeper to Jesus Christ to find more of your sufficiency in him. When I'm not suffering, I don't go to the living stone as much for life and sustenance. And when I'm suffering, I live there. I live there because I can't function. I can't even think without him. And so this suffering and afflictions and squeezings are to drive you coming to him as to a living stone, finding all of that in Christ. So they, uh, Acts 5, 41, they went on their way from the presence of the council after beatings, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. They just suffered shame and rejoicing. And, and they're, 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 they're rejoicing because we got to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Suffering is not good in and of itself, but it is when it's for the name of Jesus Christ. Wear it like a badge. Love it. I love it. Suffer for his name's sake. I heard some quotes I came across this week when I was studying. Uh, I, I just want to read a few of them to you and, I, and take it in. I think it's going to help us marry these two things together. Paul Brandt was a surgeon and he went to India to serve as a missionary. His mother was an amaz- amazing missionary there as well. There's some great quotes about her life. I think she died at 98 on the mission field. But he said this, he said, I have come to see that pain and pleasure come to us not as opposites, but as Siamese twins, strangely joined and intertwined. Nearly all my memories of acute happiness, in fact, involve some element of pain or struggle. Every memory I have of acute happiness is linked with pain or struggle because in it is where I find the deeper joy in Christ. 
Many of you know one of my great heroes of the faith is Samuel Rutherford. He spent time in, in prison and, and he wrote the letters of Samuel Rutherford. And there, there was a delight and a love for Christ like no one I've ever read before. And if you've never read his letters, I encourage you to get a hold of that. But listen to what he said. He said, I accept being put into the cellars of suffering because the great king keeps his best wine there. I find the sweetest wine, the sweetest blessings, the best places are in the cellars of suffering. That's where I drink the deepest of the living water. It's where the best wines are in the cellar. And of course, our favorite Charles Spurgeon, those who dive into the seas of affliction bring up the rarest pearls. John Piper said the summary of what they said is, guys, Peter's about the cellar and the wines and the pearls and acute happiness that come by not getting your earthly comforts and desires. The deepest joys and pleasures come with walking with Christ in the valley of the shadows, and you find that he is with you. As the sufferings of Christ come upon you, as you walk in this world the way he did, that is what we've been learning throughout this whole epistle. The lashes will come upon you, and when they do, he says, keep rejoicing. Because the principle is quite simple and yet profound. It took my breath away this week. Jesus took the blows that were meant for you. Do you remember back in 1 Peter 2 and 3? Uh, he, he took the, the, the just for the unjust. And so he bore the, the wrath of God. He took the blows that were meant for us on that tree. And now we take the blows that were meant for him. Uh, I suffer for King Jesus. I'm taking, they can't find him, so they come and punch me. I get to take the blows for the one who took the blows for me. You're having koinonia with him and the rejection that's coming upon you for the name of Christ. And Paul says in Philippians, I just want to have koinonia. I want to have fellowship in his sufferings. I, I want to have that, that intimacy of suffering with Christ for his name all bound up. And he says in verse 14, so also then, or verse 13, at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. The revelation of his glory is when he returns, second coming. So Peter says, rejoice now that you're enough of a testimony of Christ that they're striking you with words or with their fists. Rejoice so that when Jesus is going to come and be revealed in glory, when you see Jesus in all of his glory and say, I suffered for that name, I suffered for his name, and I would not turn away from this glorious one who is now before me, you're going to be like, yes, I suffered for that one. I wouldn't turn. I'm going to have the fullest deepest, exalting joy in that day when we look at him and marvel and say, oh, how sweet it is that I suffered for him and didn't turn away from Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 6, he said the same thing. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, to God, you've been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Share in his sufferings now, and you'll share in his glory then. And no one's ever going to look at him in the fullness of his glory and say, I wish I wasn't so bold for Jesus. I wish I hadn't have suffered. It wasn't worth it. You're going to be so happy on that day that you followed him and suffered anything for Jesus Christ. I want to see men, women, and children follow this king at any price, at any cost. And I want, you, I want to be with you how happy you're going to be on that day that he returns. I hope he comes back today and I get to be with all of you and to just all of our joy together looking at him saying, I am so glad that I laid it all out for that one. Galatians 6, from now on, let no, no one cause trouble for me, said Paul, 
for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus Christ. Paul's boast was to lift up his shirt and show all the scars from his beatings and his rods and the whips and say, these are for the name of Christ. I want to suffer for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and have intimacy and fellowship and oneness in and through him. I wear my suffering like a badge, and I rejoice that I was counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. I like when I get persecuted. If Jesus came back today, they would treat him the same way they did the first time. And may I represent him enough in this world that they will beat me because they can't get to this Christ. The closest they can get is me. Give me the blows for that one. Rejoice now, because one day you are going to be ecstatic when he's revealed in glory. Do we need repentance from trying to figure out how to be a Christian in this society without bringing the ire for Christ upon us? We, We are experts at how to avoid suffering of this world, how to just take enough of the edges off so they like us. And I just pray that we would repent and all we care about is that name above every name no matter what comes. Quit, quit hedging your bets. Hope with finality on the coming to you grace of God to be revealed at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Expect it. Keep rejoicing in it. And thirdly, I better get moving. Uh, is it raining? <laughs> the, the blessing of suffering, if you'll look with me in verse 14. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Sounds just like the Beatitudes. Why? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. <laughs> There's so much here. I probably should have done three sermons, but they're just too interconnected. I, I just, there's a power to keep this together. So here it is. You're blessed to be envied, uh, to, to be uh, the blessings, the favor of God rejoiced upon. This is so, such a blessing if you're persecuted. Why? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And that's so powerful. It's just, this is the objective presence of God, not a subjective happiness. You'll just feel happy. This is that you're gonna have the real presence of God. And so when in great distress, you are given a great consolation. So when you're suffering, the Spirit comes and you have this great comfort to the degree that you're suffering. Great suffering, but guys, there's great support from God. You have such a support in the Spirit of God. And so I need this greatly because when I read Fox's Book of Martyrs, Uh, I get some encouragement and I get some anxiety saying, how will I do with that? Have you ever watched on the internet the beheadings of the Christians by ISIS and you're watching them just sit there and have their heads cut off and say, could I do that? What would I do if I had to kneel down and do that with my head? And some of these other descriptions that I read in Fox's Book of Martyrs where they had to watch their kids be tortured. They had to sit there and watch their wives be tortured. How would I do watching that if I could just recant and they would leave them alone? And that's a tough question. And I want you to hear Peter's word for that. I want you to hear a one that's going to take Peter to be crucified upside down. When great suffering comes and maybe your deathbed, whatever it's going to be, he is not a cold, distant God. Wondering how are they going to do? I wonder if they'll persevere through this. No, he will come upon you, suffering one, and he will let you see his glory and all of his beauty, and that will sustain your faith. The Spirit of God will see to it. Corey Ten Boone, she asked her father, how do I know when, when, the, when the Jews are being persecuted in World War II, how do I know if I'll be strong if the Germans come to take us away? She said, I don't want to be a traitor and I don't want to fail as a young girl. And he said, Corey, when I send you on a train to your grandmother's, do I give you your ticket three weeks ahead of time to get on the train? And she said, no, when I get on. So God will give you the power in the hour of trial and not before. And so he did for Corey Ten Boone. And so this is it. When that suffering comes, the spirit of God, uh, the, uh, the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. God He will come to us. 
Like the Shekinah coming upon the tabernacle, His Spirit comes upon suffering Christians. There's this unique intimacy and presence and empowerment. He's able. And all I could think of was Stephen. And Stephen there, standing before that crowd, preaches one of the best sermons ever preached. And it says he's filled with the Spirit. And the Spirit comes and he's smiling, seeing the glory of God. And here come the stones and all of the hatred. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so here it is, is, is the Spirit came upon Stephen. We see it with Paul as he's about to be beheaded outside of Rome. He goes before a mock court. All of his friends desert him, and he gives a defense. And they say, we'll hear from you tomorrow. And he writes his last letter to Timothy. And he says that my last defense all deserted me, but not the Lord. He stood by me, and he gave me strength. And so I want you to be just confident in God. Uh, when these things come, the Spirit of God will empower us and show us his glory, strengthen us, his nearness, it's just, it's, it should make you radical that w whatever comes upon you in persecution and suffering for this name, the Spirit of God rests upon you and He's with you and He will empower you to do things that we could never do in our own flesh. Isn't that a sweet promise for some of you who are scared of a deathbed? It's gonna, he's going to come. I, I've been to so many deathbeds from, I've told you before, strong saints and weak saints. And God came the same way to each one of them. And he comes, and he meets you, and it's beautiful. And I want you to just be full with this truth. Fourthly, we need to ask why I'm suffering. I'm going to suffer after I go an hour over. <clears throat> Fifth, verse 15, I'm going to move real quick now. Just make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief, or an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. Isn't that an interesting list? I, I get, don't, don't be murderers, don't be thieves or evildoers. We kind of get it if you suffer for that. But troublesome meddlers, those are people sticking their nose in everyone else's business. Those are Christians running around trying to tell everybody how society should make their laws, and, and we just go around sticking our noses in everything. If you're suffering for being a troublesome meddler, he says, don't do it. Don't, don't, don't go around murdering people and lying and living a certain way. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, that's your suffering because you're naming the name of Jesus and you're living like it. If you suffer for that, do not be ashamed, but to glorify God in this name. When all of your grounds for joy and satisfaction are taken away, everything that's ever supported your happiness is removed, and now as you're suffering, you're going to show what is the most important thing to you. And the most important thing is God, and he's going to get all of the glory. God's going to be glorified in your suffering. As you show the world, this name is worth getting my head cut off for. This name is worth getting rejected at work. This is worth all the kids in school making fun of me and, and ridiculing me. This is worth anything because I show the world the value of Jesus Christ. Beautiful to give him glory as we suffer for him. Fifthly, we need to understand our suffering. Look with me in verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Do you remember back in verse 7, the end is near. It's time to clean up the household of God. And judgment is to begin with us. God is judging the church. Notice <clears throat> it's not wrath. He's judging the church by purifying and chastening us. So he is now in these end times, we need to be purified and we need to be a people who are ready. And so God is purging us and he's purifying us. And, and we're living in a culture that's becoming so godless and immoral. And we're not to go with it. We're not to think like it, and we're not to live like it. This next generation is rising up against their parents, calling them legalists and all of these things because they hold to truth. We stand up against this. We stand up against this. And God is purging and purifying the church. And if he begins here in working us and ch chastening, chastening us and putting us in furnaces and bringing persecutions to, to purify us, what's going to happen 
to the unbeliever. Right now, God is making a bride spotless for his son. And I just want you to get that. We need judgment to begin with the household of God. We need to take holiness serious again. And the instrument to do that is suffering and persecution and trials of every kind. Why am I suffering? I need to be purified. I need to grow and become more like Christ. Just this apathy is not going to work. We've got to quit being drowsy and meandering. God's going to wake us up. And he's going to bring some chastisement. He's going to bring some persecution and all of these different things. It's going to begin with the household of God. It starts right here. But I want you to get this. If God begins with us first, what are going to become of those who don't obey the gospel of God? And here's his point. It's better to suffer now for the name of Jesus than to suffer for eternity for rejecting his son and his offer of grace. I'd rather suffer now for the name of Jesus than suffer eternally under the wrath of God forever. Someone has to suffer. Now for his name or for eternity for rejecting this beautiful name of Jesus who's held himself out and offered for all to come to him that you might have life. And you rejected it. And he says, judgment has come upon you. And let's close with the most beautiful point. I, this, this verse is changing my life. The sixth point is entrust your soul to God then. If you'll look with me in verse 19, you guys know how much I like therefore. It's going on the tombstone. Therefore, what is it there for? And it's, it's beautiful. It's therefore in light of what we just looked at, it's suffering. All these beautiful realities is now live in light of that. Don't just look at them and nod your head. Therefore, there's a response that God wants from you in light of this truth. And there's some who think this therefore is the whole epistle. This is everything that Peter's been writing to this afflicted church where he's been leading them is he wants to bring them to this therefore. He wants to see in light of all these truths that we've learned and understood, therefore, there's something that I want from you. This is the bottom line of how Peter wants to help the suffering Christians who have been dispersed in Asia Minor. How are we to think about all this suffering? <clears throat> how are we to respond to such hostility and difficulty? Let those who suffer hear this according to the will of God. This is from God, not the devil overpowering him. Please hear that. You've got to get this in your mind and in your heart and into your will. This is from God. Do you believe that? I need you to settle that in your heart this morning. And once you've settled that, what do you do with that? What do you do with Christians who are being killed at Nero's parties, pitch being poured on them, and they're being lit up as the lights? What do you do with a whole world that hates you and is trying to destroy you? With a God who's bringing trials and afflictions into your life? What do you do with that? Do you fight it? And honestly, do you just spend all your days trying to get out of it? To use your wisdom and your great knowledge to figure out how to change it? Your, your ability to talk and work your way out of things? How, how about let's throw all of our resources at it and fix it? Let's, let's, your children are rejecting the faith. Let's get nasty with them and tell them they're going to hell every day. How about lose your integrity so you can get money wrongly? Despair and depression. Do you keep fighting to change his will? To get everyone you know, I'm gonna get the whole church to pray for me because then God will change his will? I'm just gonna spend everything I have to get God to change. Do you know how many believers are on this little wheel of I've gotta just change it, I'm trying to fix it, I need this, I need that. I watch this on a daily basis. I just, I gotta fix it, I gotta correct it. I gotta hang on and bite the bullet because it's gonna get better one day. Guys, this is what my whole life has come down to. I believe this is what this whole letter is coming down to. This is what God wants from us, his children. This is what he was doing in Peter's life. Do you remember when we began this epistle? Peter would not submit. I'm gonna be crucified. No, you're not. He grabs him and rebukes him. Get behind me, Satan. You don't have your, your mind on God, but on the devil's. And then it's finally, it's time for me to die. Uh, Peter pulls out the sword, no way, and cuts an ear off. Peter would not submit to God's way. 
He had a better way and it, it couldn't be a crucified Savior. And he would not submit. And this is what God did in his whole life with Peter. And he broke him. And now he says, you're gonna submit and you're gonna be led where you don't wanna go and you're gonna go to a cross and you'll even say, I wanna go upside down because I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Peter now writes this letter to suffering saints, submission, submission. Bring your will under God's. It sounds so simple, but this is what we're all fighting and wrestling. And here's what he wants from you this morning. Entrust. Entrust your soul to a faithful creator. Submit. Give to him with joy and peace and trust your life. I, I like that phrase, glad surrender. This is not saying uncle it's not tapping out. That means that you beat me. This means I surrender all. I surrender all to you, Lord. Are you done trying to be God? Are you done trying to remove suffering from your life? Are you ready? Are you done being sick and discouraged and walking around like Eeyore all of your life? The one who's seasick through the voyage of life. Are you tired of it? The one when asked, how are you doing? And you grunt miserably, embittered. Uh, but if I'm a Christian, I can't talk that way. I'm just always disappointed and I'm always let down. That is not Christianity. I beg you, I'm a minister for your joy. I want to give you joy this morning. And here it is. Everything that God is doing in your life is to make you like Jesus Christ. Will you entrust yourself to it? I'm tired of nodding to a bunch of doctrines and not giving our lives to Jesus Christ. We, 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 I believe that, I believe that, I believe that, but I will not surrender my life to God. And this whole gospel is adoption and surrender now, your God. You take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. I surrender and I let you bring into my life whatever you want, however you want to squeeze me, however you want to afflict me, whatever you want to take out of my life. Surrender to the one who knows better than you do. He's perfect. He knows what you need. And when we'll finally just come to entrust, you'll have peace like a river and joy like a fountain. That's what will come. And, and we're just Americans under pressure, trying to change, trying to correct, and we will not entrust our souls to a God who's given us every reason in this Bible to give him everything. Quit controlling everything and trying to be God. Entrust yourself to God. It's the safe place. It's the beautiful place. You'll be blessed beyond belief. All those people walking around whistling in affliction in this church, it's because they've entrusted themselves to God. And trust your soul to a faithful creator. I trust you, God. I trust you, Father. And I wonder how many of us really trust God. Because this is the bottom line to your suffering. Is God wronging you? Is he cheating you? Is he shortchanging you? Or maybe boldly enough, God got it wrong. It's time to be done with this. God has this right he has your life right, and he will finish the work that he began in trust, in trust. His plans for your life, they're better than yours. Trust. And I want you to get this closing point. He says, in doing what is right, and there's a lot of debate in the Greek, but where, where it lands is this is not God doing what is right. Uh, I think faithful creator encompasses God doing what is right, but this is you doing what is right. You do what is right. So bring it back into our context. Persecution, suffering, fiery ordeals that are coming upon you, there's a way out. There's a way out. Maybe I just need to be quiet and, and let up a little bit or maybe renounce, maybe just be moral. Everybody loves moral people. No, entrust yourself to God and do what is right. Don't be moved away from doing what is right, no matter what the cost. No matter what it costs, do what is right. That's Peter's conclusion. Entrust your soul to God and do what is right. 
not what's comfortable. Even your own life, if that's the cost. And I just couldn't help but to think of the Prince of Glory. And he looked into that cup of wrath that he had to drink and it baptized him into a bloody sweat. Oh God, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but let yours be done. And so he goes as a lamb led to the slaughter and he went willfully. And he took the scourgings and the beatings and the rejections. And then he was nailed up on a cross and he's just put up there on Calvary's tree, nailed to it. And he's hanging there for three tormenting hours, draining that cup that he looked into the wrath of God. And then he concluded in the midst of the greatest torment and the greatest persecution that's ever been known on this earth. There's no one who has ever persecuted more deeply or greater than Jesus Christ. And on that cross, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then he died. He entrusted his soul to a faithful creator as he did what was right. Dying in our place to redeem a people for himself for the glory of his father. And he just entrusted his soul in the middle of all of that. I entrust my spirit to you. And now he says, will you walk in my footsteps? To never turn away from doing what is right and entrust ourselves to a faithful creator as the hatred and opposition and suffering comes upon us. And so to God be the glory for the privilege to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ, to take the blows that are meant for him because I'm beginning to reflect him to this world because he took the blows for me on Calvary. Doesn't that empower you? It's so rich. Let's go to our God and ask him to produce that fruit in every life here this morning. God, I pray for these dear brothers and sisters. I pray for my own heart. God, I pray that we would lay hold of this treatise on suffering, that we would understand it, that we would have koinia and fellowship in your sufferings. God, that we would abide and, and know you, Jesus, and and to, to rejoice in, in sharing in your sufferings. <clears throat> I thank you, God, that this world is spitting us out in some degree or another. And I pray for any weary, discouraged, downtrodden soul, whether it be the world or their own family, whatever it would be, God, encourage them. Let them wear it like a badge. Let them have fellowship with Jesus for suffering for his name's sake. God, I thank you for it. And what I want, Father, for every one of us here this morning is that everyone would lay down trying to be God and they would truly entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. God, let us entrust. You are so worthy to surrender all of our lives to every circumstance, everything. God, we, we surrender and we entrust to you. God, I pray for any unbelievers that they would see what that cup, that cup brought the Son of God into a bloody sweat, that they would never dare stand before that wrath in their own person, that this morning they would call upon the name of the one that hung in that place on a cross, that bore that wrath so they wouldn't have to. God, grant them the gift of repentance and faith this morning. Let them call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Thank you for meeting us here in the word of God. Now empower us to walk in the therefore and to surrender our lives to you gladly. Amen.